Sure. I think so, yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to 440 Gallery Artist Talk. Today, we have the pleasure of talking about the 18th annual Small Works Show. This show was curated by Johnny Thornton, who's here to talk about the curation. And uh, I'm not sure how we selected three artists out of, I think, 84 amazing artists. Yeah. Uh, but we've selected three. We've selected Aaron Juliana, Miguel Reyes, and Marlene Weissman. So they're here to talk about their work today, and they're kind of representing a big range of uh, approaches. So um, we're first going to take a look at the installation shots right now. That's what you're seeing. And um, I want to say I'm going to be the, asking the questions. And if you have questions that come up, for any of the artists or for Johnny, um, you could either put them in the chat or you could just wait. And when I'm done asking questions, I'm gonna open it to the group. And uh, at that time you can unmute. So before that, I'd like you to stay muted so that we don't have um, any feedback. Uh, let's see, is there anything else before I get into questions? Did you say what you needed to say, Susan? Okay, uh, so as we finish looking at the installation, then we're going to look at each piece individually. So when that begins, I'm going to ask Johnny his questions, and you can be thinking about any questions you might have for him. As you can see, there's a huge range of sizes, even though it's small works, everything is under 12 inches by 12 inches, and uh, a huge range of approaches. And take note of this in interesting installation, because this was um, the curator was also the installation person. Okay, so I'm starting with each of the images, seeing the individuals. So uh, enjoy seeing the individuals, and I'm going to start asking Johnny. Johnny, congratulations on curating a beautiful, intriguing show. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about your curation. I know there were a lot of entries, and I'm sure folks are curious about your selection process. And be honest, was this fun? Would you do it again? So this insula this this whole show, uh, I think we got over fourteen hundred entries, about five hundred people. I want to see. So this was a multi-faceted curation. I sort of kept whittling it down over the course of a month, um, but there was a lot of amazing work. I I could have curated five or six small work shows just based on the entries we got. Um, we really got some amazing entries. Um, the process was really, you know, I, I, you know, it was a long process. I would give myself about a, a few hours each time to kind of go through everything and, and whittle it down, whittle it down. And as you whittled it down, it got harder and harder and harder. But instead of kind of picking one kind of work or I really wanted a general swath of styles uh, to, to represent the, all of the entries. Um, it was fun. It was fun, but also uh, heart wrenching. I mean, there was some heart wrenching decisions. There was, you know, I think there's eighty something pieces in the show. Um, you know, that last two hundred was like the hardest thing ever. It's like, uh, so I had to say goodbye to a lot of works that I loved and didn't include in the show. Um, but seeing the final product, I'm really happy with the work that I chose and how it all came together. Yeah, how fun to have a. 84 pieces that you love each piece. I love, yeah, I love all of the work in this show. It's, it's such great work. Uh, so let's talk about size. What are your thoughts about the size limitation? Did you, did it play out uh, when your selections were revealed in real life? Because I know sometimes it can be hard to 
to see what the size is going to be like in the digital format. So uh, my initial kind of first few phases of the curation, I didn't take size into consideration at all, with the exception of one piece, uh, Jenny Woo's, which I just love. It was so it, it's so tiny. Um, that was like that was the first piece I saw that I, I thought was just like magical. And I'm like, oh, it's so tiny. Um, but for the rest of them, I really didn't pay attention to size until I got it down to kind of the final 200. And sometimes, you know, you had to make decisions based on size sort of at the end, which was really hard, but that helped me in my final kind of uh, pare down of the work. Um, but, you know, once you see them in person and, you know, I, I, th I think it's always different looking at something in the digital and then seeing it in person and, and um, you know, some of the sizes kind of, you, you know, even though you see the dimensions on the, on the screen, they kind of, you're like, oh, this one's a little bigger, this one's a little smaller, but, um, uh, you know, this, this little piece, Nancy Krinsky, that's on the work right now, and Tyler Jones, like, these ones, you know, like, were, in the, in the whole process, I had no idea how big that was, because I wasn't paying attention to sizes until we got to the last few hundred, I was like, oh, it's really tiny, how cool, <laughs> um, so it didn't really take into consideration until, like, the final big phase of my curation. Well, it all worked out. Um, so I know you chose to hang the show as part of the curation. And what was like, that like? Was it surprising? Was it challenging? It was really challenging. Um, this, this whole small works process, I mean, I've, I've curated a lot of shows, um, never one with this many artists. Um, but you know, I, I will say, I think, I, I'm not sure who at 440 was in charge of patching the walls. I think it was Joanne AC, but I owe her a debt of gratitude. Uh, me, me and um, the program director at Arts Gowanus, Emily Chiavelli, uh, we spent about two days. We kind of hung things. We would move things around. We just kept uh, reformatting the show until it looked right to us. Um, it, was, it was a fun process, really challenging, but I, I was really happy with the final product. Yeah, it really looks great, as um, Gail was telling us when she came in. And um, what I love is that the piece, the groupings that you created really show each piece to its best advantage, which is what we all, you know, dream of when we see our work hanging in a gallery. Um, so finally, tell us about your juror's choice. Um, the juror's cho choice, actually, I, I mentioned already, was the Jenny Wu's piece. I just, uh, it was one of the first pieces that I was like, oh, this is definitely in the show. Um, I, I love it. And seeing it in person was even, I was like, wow. Um, it's it's so small, but so powerful. Um, it was really a piece immediately. It was like in the first, you know, when I was going through like the 1400, it was the first piece that I was like, uh-huh. Like it's tiny, it's mighty, it's it's colorful, and I love the way it's made. Uh, seeing it in person, I was like, oh, it's just as cool as it looked on screen. Um, so I just, I love that piece. Yeah, it was so small. We had a bit of a scramble. We thought we lost it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's literally <laughs> a fraction of an inch. Um, well, thank you, Johnny. And I bet there'll be more questions for you. But let's, uh, oh, and there's a few more, uh, or is this the last one, Susan? Uh, last one. Okay, so then uh, uh, who's, who do we have up next? Aaron. Aaron, Aaron Giuliano. Congratulations, Aaron, on being selected for the Small Work Show. Thank you. If you could tell us about what drew you to make a piece in this scale and what the, pros and cons of working small are for you? Sure. Um, so I actually prefer working small scale, and this is pretty typical of my usual studio practice. Um, I haven't really worked larger than like 18 by 24 for a while. Um, and I feel like sometimes small scale work gets a little bit of a bad rap. Like sometimes people will come into my studio and just be like, why don't you make these larger? Um, but I also do a lot of hand sewing. Um, so I find this scale really works for me because I like something that's 
handheld that I can just like flip over and manipulate. And I really like to create multiple smaller works and then play around with arranging them in my studio as a collection. And I think about them more as like separate pieces, but then they kind of grow outward into like a little organism that functions as a singular unit. Um, and in terms of the pros of working small scale, just from a practical standpoint for me with doing a lot of hand sewing, like, and it's such a labor intensive process, it is helpful. Um, and I can just kind of work through ideas, I feel a little bit more quickly. And like I said, I love kind of picking a theme and then just working within a series. And I would say um, the cons for me, I find sometimes that maybe the smaller pieces won't have as much of an emotional impact as a piece that's closer to like human scale, um, especially sometimes related to the concepts that I study in my work, which are very bodily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the artists selected to talk today all work very differently. Can you tell us what goes into your art making process? I mean, you've touched on it a little bit, but um, and you said this is typical scale for you. And um, and I'm seeing from the other pieces you provided that this looks like similar materials. Mm -hmm. But um, what's what's the process? Sure. So my process with this series in particular started with some small scale watercolor paintings. And then once I was just working through some ideas, I either started making larger acrylic paintings or these sculptural weavings. And I use a lot of thrifted and repurposed and vintage fabrics, just kind of thinking about a lot of the environmental impact of the textile industry. And I start by just cutting them into tons of different strips of different widths. And then I'll use my sewing machine to sew them into tubes. Then I stuff them, um, depending on the width, with either yarn or polyfill. And then I will weave them through a structured metal support like I did here um, with the piece that was in the show. Or um, I will sometimes put armature wire inside of the tube so they can be a little bit more freeform. And then everything is tacked into place and kind of secured on the back just using old fashioned hand sewing with a needle and thread. And the grid in this piece that was in the show is just a commercial display grid that I found that's usually meant for merchandise. Um, and sometimes I play around with making my own like wire grid supports as well. And yeah, so this piece is pretty typical for me in terms of materials and scale. I will say some of my more recent work I've been using a lot of very stretchy knit fabrics, which I find are more flexible. Um, and I've stepped away from the grid forms as much. I'm, I'm still making wall pieces, but they're a little bit more sculptural and organic rather than being supported by a metal frame. And I really love interacting with a grid, but now I like that my pieces are kind of more um, self-supported and it gives me more options just in terms of take, like creating differently shaped forms rather than being like restricted to a grid. Thank you, that explains it really well. And um, uh, I really am impressed with your process of all the stages it goes through to, so, I think that really contributes to the like feeling of emotionality that goes into it, mm. um, which leads me to my next question. So uh, this piece beautifully incorporates playfulness, craft, and sculptural considerations, along with iconogra iconographic re references and emotional impact. Can you tell us what your uh, intentions are for as far as content and um who your influences are sure thank you uh so I guess my my background is actually in painting but I've always bounced back and forth between working with textiles and working with paint 
And my watercolor paintings are usually either just invented abstract forms, or there'll be images that look like microscopic views of woven fibers or medical diagrams. And in the sculptural weavings, like this piece, I really want the soft forms to resemble the body, either in an internal way or an external way in terms of like organs. Um, a friend of mine once came into my studio and referred to these pieces as looking like Muppet intestines, which I absolutely <laughs> loved. <laughs> so, um, and I think about the materials very symbolically, and I, I, there's just an exciting, endless possibility to me of having very imperfect organic structures that exist inside or around something that's very rigid and geometric. And my own medical history was my primary inspiration for my work when I first started working with um, metal and textile together. And my paintings and my embroideries used to be way more representational and actually uh, figurative self-portraits. And I would use like the silhouette of my own body and images from my x-rays. Um, because I, I actually have metal rods that were implanted in my spine when I was an adolescent to correct a, a spinal deformity. And then over the years, I've been approaching this theme a little bit more abstractly and just kind of simplifying that interest down to depicting these two forces with the structure of the grid and like these fluid textiles as just a metaphor for the human body and how imperfect it is. And I think about the tension between natural and man-made that exists literally within my own body um, while I'm like combining these soft fibers and this very rigid metal. And I like to just play around with symmetry and asymmetry and just this organic and geometric sort of tension coexisting. And in terms of my influences with my work in, in general, as well as for this piece, um, something that was a huge influence for me when I was growing up is actually the, the broken column self-portrait by Frida Kahlo, because I loved the idea of having a self-portrait that was internal and external simultaneously and thinking about things like architectural structures very symbolically like a spinal column and a column column that you would have in architecture and just like reflecting on your medical history as, as a subject matter and uh, kind of more closely related to working with textile. I, I love Louise Bourgeois fabric sculptures. Um, to me, it was the first time I really saw like depicting flesh using a material that we would typically like cover our own flesh with on a daily basis. And I find that her bodies are very like bulbous and disturbing. And there's something very surgical about them, which resonates with me as well, where you can see the flesh is like literally sewn together. So um, it's kind of has that medical vibe to it, which I, I gravitate towards. And there are some contemporary artists that I really love as well. Um, there's an artist named Daisy Collinridge who makes these flesh suits that are actually worn and very performative. And they're made with like very warm pastel fabrics. And one of the things I like the most about her concepts is she thinks about how fabric breaks down and is very impermanent very similar to the human body. So she's really connecting fabric and flesh in, in that way. And um, I also love, I would say was very influential to me when I first saw some of this work in the um, early 2000s was Gada Amir, who had a piece called The New Albers. And it was an embroidery, like a color field embroidery but the embroideries themselves were figurative and um, like the female body and face, but it was 
put together in a pattern that resembled a Joseph Albers like color field painting. And that was one of the first times I was really seeing an artist just playing with craft and fine art and this language of minimalism and sort of the language of repeat patterns that you would see in, in textile work and like making the threads resemble paint and resemble drips. So I like that she was exploring a little bit of the gendered history there that exists with fine art versus um, a craft art and some how textiles have been a little bit, you know, more marginalized just in terms of the canon of art history. So I found that to be really influential for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erin. Sure. A lot of insight and um, a lot to think about. So. Yeah, I'm also noticing someone put a couple questions in the in the chat, if you don't mind me. Um, well, we're going to swing back to the chat after okay. everybody gets a chance. Chat to at the end. Got it. Make sure that everybody has time. Sure, no problem. Uh, but thank you. Sure, so thank, thank you, Aaron. And now we're going to move on. I think we have um, Miguel up next. Is that? Yes. So uh, Miguel Reyes, uh, congratulations on being selected for the Small Work Show. Uh, can you please tell us what drew you to make work on this scale and what are the pros and cons of working at this scale for you? Thank you. Oh, uh, well, um, this is a long story, but I'm gonna try to make it short. Um, first of all, I, I started at the school doing uh, big paintings and, uh, and then I went, went to the abstract paintings, abstract style. Mm -hmm. And then that drew me to the conceptual art. And then I start uh, experimenting many things. All this was in Mexico before I came here. Okay. So when I came here, I found a lot of um, painting and I found that the spaces are small, I don't know, smaller than, my, than, in, than, than, in, than in Mexico City, it's, it's, it's New York. You have, have to fit everything in a small apartment, in a small studio, in a small shell, in a small everything. So the only way that I can make artwork was doing in a small sizes. So I started doing uh, paintings daily because here I found the that, that movement, movement that they call um, daily painting, that is uh, painting, uh, doing a painting every day. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that and uh, playing with color. And, uh, and that's drew me to, to continue painting in a small, in a small, small scale, scale. So, and about the pros and cons, I found a lot of pros. One is that I can paint fast. I can storage and it's, it's not expensive. It's easy for transportation. I can paint one painting a day or two. Um, that's made me lose in my broad stroke. Um, and it's affordable. It's affordable for people. Yes. So the only, the only cons that I can say is, you know, when you have a, when you try to sell a, a big painting, with a, did you sell a big painting, you get a lot of money. <laughs> when you try to, to sell a, a small painting, you, wanna, you, you, you have to sell a lot of small paintings <sighs> to get the same quantity. So that is the hard part, but I think it's, it's more advantageous to do it in, in a small scale. But variety, I think, would be the best because you can balance it and, uh, and make more choices for everyone. And, to, and it's at the same time for um, this, when I can explore more, um, more ways to, to, to express oneself in the, in the, in the artwork. Mm -hmm. Yes, good points all. Um, so 
as we said before, all of the artists selected today are working very differently. Can you talk about what goes into your art making process and if this is um, typical in terms of materials and scale? Yeah, I, I usually um, I usually work in series, small series mm -hmm. and a small scale. Okay. So I start doing choices. I ch start choosing objects, a single object, a single size, um, a single point of view, or a single background. And I start arrange it on the on, on, on when I set my table because I usually work uh, uh, from natural. I mean, uh, I paint and drew everything that I see before me, and uh, and then from from I, after I set everything, I start doing small sketches with with a uh, with pencil just to get the composition right, you know. And then, and then I start sketching, as you see in the in, in the pictures. I start sketching with the with the charcoal and fix it, and I start doing some uh, some dabs here or there, just to get the colors and tones right and try to follow. But uh, the thing here is that in, in okay. I, I, well, and sometimes the, the, the objects bring me some ideas. But in this case, the MP keys uh, came from, uh, from my last job, from this part of the pandemic. Uh, it was like, I it was, it was so happy in my, 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 my doing, doing my job in that company called Ming Production Barcelona is uh, MP Barcelona. So the MP brought me a key to get in and, and I manage the products and everything and I design it and I, and I do almost everything there. And I was so happy. And, uh, and then suddenly the pandemic came and the office shut, uh, was closed. Everything was shut down. I lose my job. The, the warehouse moved to Texas. And, and then when I was looking in, a, in, in one day, I was looking in, in a, for an object in a drawer where I found that key. And, I, and that came a lot of memories about it. And I said, oh, I was so happy there. And I tried to express in this painting about, uh, using the color, the, that time in the mornings when I, when I spend a few minutes before I start working, when I take my, my, my breakfast in the office. So that's what is the, the, the name of this. And as you see in the, in the picture, if you can uh, pass the slides, you can see how it's filling the spaces and how it's just uh, like breaking the color in the small in the small depths, boom, 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 boom. It's like 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 broken uh, broken small depths of colors, but um, and well, well, uh, to sum up, yeah, the uh, it's typical for me to use the materials and everything. Oh, that painting! You see that painting is one of the other series I am you. And I'm doing using a different background with objects. Uh, you can see my glasses there and a background that is something that I have a, yeah, right behind me. It's a, I have a calendar with an image there. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's almost the same thing. It's what I'm working on now. Uh, but I, 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 I like to show you how to do it. Yeah, uh, how I do it. This one is part of the process of another painting. As you see, I started drawing. Sometimes I forget to draw it. I'm sincerely, I forget. Uh, sometimes I forget drawing it. And then when I just, I mean, start painting and I said, oh my God, this is, this is not right. This is wrong. So I have to redraw it again with the charcoal and then start it out again, start it over it. 
So this is this is uh, one of the this is one of the last paintings. Yeah, this is the end painting, as you see it. Yeah. Um, so are you working in acrylic or oil? In oil, oil, oil. oil. Yeah, maybe I didn't I didn't tell you. Yeah, I work with uh, oil on panel. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this is just exquisite work. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in a way, you're representing here for the representational <laughs> artists. And I think it's interesting that it sounds like you went through uh, a lot of different approaches um, to end up working representationally. And this piece and all your work, I can see is beautifully observed and painted with such delicacy. Can you talk about uh, what's your inspiration? I mean, you did talk about your inspiration. And by the way, I, I found those keys very moving in the in the painting. Maybe, um, Susan, you could go back to the one that's in the show. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm impressed that 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 was the story behind it because it really came through in the actual painting. So um, can you talk about your inspiration and your influences? All right. Um, well, uh, I want to tell you an anecdote. Uh, when I was a, when I was a, when I was a student, so I was studying art in the art school. I had a close friend of mine where I used to throw everywhere and uh, we were in the throwing class that day and uh, and I had a I did a pretty good uh, drawing because I I had more practice than him it's not because I'm I'm, I'm very good no, no 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 that time I had a lot of more practice so he said oh, how did you how, how how did you draw that 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 uh that drawing with so accuracy you know say okay what i said was uh where i put the eye i put the line so what i and, and i'm trying to do in the same thing here in, in in paintings where i see i'm trying to translate in 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 uh in a in a broad strokes like like the Japanese or, or Chinese uh, did it, but it wasn't that influence that didn't influence me. Uh, when I came here, because in Mexico we can we cannot see too much uh, American artists. There's you you can see it easily, so. When I came here and I started visiting the museums, it was so amazing. When I found Sargent, when I could see Winslow Omer, Andrew Wyatt, Edward Hopper, it's oh my God, this, those those are great, those are great artists. And I haven't and I haven't knew it. So what I what I think is it was an impact to see Sargent. And uh, and it was it's too similar to Soroya, and uh, and I let them to influence my work, Soroya and Sargent. Um, yeah, and that's 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 the story. Oh, that's beautiful, and uh, yeah, we can see. Look at see a little hint of Sargent here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miguel. Thank you. And uh, finally, last but not least at all, we're going to speak with Marlene Weissman. Marlene, congratulations on your being selected for the Small Work Show. Thank you. Can you tell us what drew you to work at this scale and what the pros and cons for you are working in the small scale? Sure. So um, I start with source material that I sourced from one of my favorite places, the 99 cents store. And I actually am holding a little bit of the material here. So I'm a collagist and as collagists have traditionally worked with found papers and magazine pages, I came across a stash of placemat sized 
or small poster sized plastic, ridiculously banal 3D <laughs> images, um, kitsch images of nature scenes and religious scenes and puppies and landscapes and I love them. They had such depth and they were lenticular images. So I, I guess I should explain about lenticular in a minute. But the reason I work small is that the source material has a size limitation. And I'm taking parts of the material, not the whole image, but just selected segments to then cut out and then subversively scratch and remove the backing of. Um, I was playing around with them. When I first found these images, I brought them to my studio. And I'm thinking, what can I do with them? And if you could see on that left picture on the upper left, when I flipped one of the images over one day and took a palette knife and started scratching into it, I was able to remove the print from the back and which would leave a clear window uh, of space there. And then flipping it over and throwing it on my um, very always cluttered work table, collage elements could peek through these windows and interact with the 3D areas that I've left in the piece. Um, so that's the whole kind of key to the process and why I work small. I like to make small pieces in the way that people, my pieces really have a mesmerizing quality and they draw people in. So people walk over and they look really close and they kind of lose themselves in this slightly psychedelic and 3D um, image. Now I did send a film, oh, there it goes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not as smooth as it is on Instagram. But as you can see, there is a 3D element. And again, maybe not coming up on the um, on this PowerPoint, but um, uh, they really come alive in person. And as you can see there, I've even played with a fourth layer. So there's a layer of collage underneath this original image of peonies and part of an egret, as you can see on the lower left. And underneath is found paper and my own mark making and um, images there. And then on this particular piece, I have another layer. And those are, they're kind of like, um, they can be called cabochons, but they're like picture, they're acrylic and they're half globes, they're clear. And when you put them against material, they magnify them. So they're little, you could say little magnifying lenses, but they're the uh, 21st century kind of cheaper versions of like, like nice quality um, magnifying lenses, but they, they do the trick. So it makes it really interesting. And the whole piece has this glassy like quality to it. That's really fun. And again, these really need to be seen in person. And this is a six inch by six inch piece. Uh, and there's a, a nice like thick two inch depth to it. And this is on wood panel. And um, so that's that's the pieces. Um, and I can talk about lenticular, Karen, if you would like me to say a few words of what that is. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on what you're saying that um, the, I, I, I lost what you call them, the circle, the, like the dome. Cabochons maybe, or Cabochon, they're, yeah. Yes. And the thickness of the piece itself are, uh giving them uh, this whole 3d uh, it, like the piece is 3d to begin with and then the 3d depth and the size all complement each other so it really makes sense that they're this size so yeah um so obviously i don't think anyone else is working with, uh, <laughs> the material as you are so yeah can you tell a little more about the um the like I think people are familiar with this. Uh, what is it called? Lenticular um, uh, 3D image, where if you move it, it changes. Sure, sure. So again, I don't these... know if that's what's going on with this, but 
sure, uh, every sure. angle it looks different, right? Sure, every angle it looks different, and there's this magical depth to them. And really, just a few words. Lenticular, it's it's a printing process. They're printed images that are made through a technology that fuses. I think there's two images. There's a left and a right, and then the manufacturer or the printer who obviously has some kind of special press, um, fuses them together with a kind of a, there's a, a plastic sheet that has kind of like ribs to it. Like, like um, if you scratch it with your thumb, it makes a little squeaking noise. So there's um, a lined image that kind of lays over this and it's an emulsion. It's, I mean, it's not like glued over paper. It's, it's all print it's all some kind of special ink that captures this so i have a feeling it's just like a left and a right image laid over each other and then there's a plastic part that gets fused over it and it's it lets you the viewer see 3d without 3d glasses and also why i like them is that you know we're living in such a video oriented world and moving images are all part of it and as a collagist, it's so hard to compete with that and make something radically, totally, excitingly new. And I was so excited when I came up with this. It, it thrills me in the studio because it's like magical. It's just we're scraping up parts of this and putting other images underneath. And then, you know, I turn it over and uh, I keep auditioning different um, pieces of collage and how they will... Um, uh, subvert the image and um, take again these very sweet and innocuous, innocuous images and turn them into like a little, little punky, a little subversive, uh, especially with some of these like I've done puppies and I've done panda bears and um, it's, it's really funny to just scratch the living daylights out of these. And I've worked big also with repeating squares so, because again, there's a limit to my um, material, like the, the, this is six inches, but I've done big pieces where I've repeated different six inches all like lined up together as a grid, almost like what it looks like on your Instagram homepage when you see those grid of images. So maybe that's an influence that I'm not realizing too. Um, well, well, let me ask you about your influences. Uh, so even though your process is so unique, um, I, um, I have thoughts of nostalgia, movement, subversiveness. I wonder uh, it, what influences drew you to working in this way and how you describe your subject matter. Sure. Well, thanks. And those, all those words definitely apply to my series. And um, this series is called my super deep series because it brings people super deep into the idea of collage and the picture plane. So yes, all those things influence me. And I think I'm a huge pop culture and pop art person that really speaks to me and some other things that are about that, about my work. And then I'll just get into more specific influences are um, transformation and appropriation and punk attitude and the artificial versus the natural things that are like me, like I kind of like artifice, everything from, oh, I don't know, just glam rock and drag queens and all that stuff fascinates me because I love the embracing of artifice. It's just really exciting. Uh, and I, what was a, a huge, what really blew my mind was in 2019, I went to a show at the Petzl Gallery, and I have an image there from that. And this show was called Strategic Vandalism, and already they had me at Strategic Vandalism. And it was a whole show. I went twice. I was like mesmerized. They couldn't get me out of there. It blew my mind. It presented a who's who of 20th century with a few contemporary artists sprinkled in. Um, who explored the destructive impulse to transform what was considered old hat or kitsch images and, and to create totally new transformed, but thoughtful work, not just to destroy and not just to leave their mark, but to make a whole new entity out of it. And some of the artists included in this were um, Max Ernst and Asger Yorn. It's, it was actually based on 
Asger Jorn, and I'm probably butchering his name, he's Scandinavian, but it was based on his modification paintings where he took thrift store paintings and turned them into other entities. And I'm a big Ray Johnson fan and Ray Johnson also um, has done this with a lot of elements. And there's a, a, an artist, Betty Tompkins, who's had made um, statements about feminism in this manner. So um, the catalog will be coming out years later, I guess because the pandemic this, um, this spring. So I'm gonna be the first to pre-order. So this was a huge, huge um, influence on me. And there's also the Situationists, which um, also like reevaluate reevaluated aesthetics of pop culture and value systems and and um, ephemeral imagery and how we see images and how we see maps and clip art and there's just such an a, a rich exciting area here for a collagist like myself and um I, I'm just off to the races on that. And I have to say also Robert Rauschenberg has been a, a huge, huge insp inspiration for me because he, ex um, uh, he was always experimenting in his studio. And even as a, a really young artist, um, I was experimenting with Xerox transfer art, which essentially um, eventually got some of my pieces in the study collection of MoMA because I was doing that back in the... Um, in the 1980s and all the way up to today. I just love experimenting and I love that Rauschenberg just kept going and kept going and he was a big inspiration. And I have two other inspirations that I have um, a visual of that ins inspired this particular piece that I was showing in the small work show. And that's uh, on the left is Mary Bauermeister and she's not very well known today. And she is amazing. She was um, someone <laughs> So uh, I feel like a kindred soul because she has used that technique of magnifying lenses and layers. And as you can see in that piece on the left, the, the lenses magnify different mark making and words, and she has different layers. And um, she was amazing. She's actually still, still around. She's in her 90s, and I, I actually had the pleasure of meeting her. I had gone to an opening um, as a fangirl to meet her uh, at the, I think it was a Michael Rosenfeld gallery, and she was there, and I brought my book, my the monograph on her, and I had a few words with her, And um, but her work is marvelous, and I encourage everyone to check out her work, and the person on the right is Jacques the I can't pronounce his last name. Well, I'll leave it to the French speakers, but he's ama he was amazing too. We just lost him, I think, in the past year. And he was uh, like a master of found paper and collaging and building up layers and, and mark making. And it, he just would take posters off walls and there's another French term, detournement, which is again to, to rip up stuff and reassemble them. And he, he was just did it so masterfully. And right now at Poster House, there's a fabulous exhibition um, on for the next, um, I don't know, a couple of weeks called um, 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 Vandals on Motorbikes or something like that. And it's all people who have done, created art and by re um, transforming found images and found advertising. And um, I just encourage everyone to go see that. And that was another mind blower for me working in this area. So I guess that will sum up <laughs> the work there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marlene. Sure. Uh, so let's um, revisit our chat because I see a bunch of questions are here. Um, uh, we have a hello, and that piece was magical. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that was Jenny Wu's that they're referring to. And Jenny Wu says, thank you. So maybe that was it. And, uh, <laughs> um, and then uh, the a question for Aaron was, does the work sometimes become fully 3D? Um, as a 
of this point it has not it is still on the wall i think that's the painter in me but i, I think we're, we're working there they're, they're slowly crawling off the wall but in, in the future chair. probably <laughs> <laughs> thank you and um uh then ellie h says i love the meaning the fabric sculptures look so cuddly too I, that's a, a lovely comment um and matthew fletcher says uh albers heart and um leh says what a beautiful story behind your artwork i think this was for miguel um oh but sadly i have to go but thank you for showing so many different wonderful pieces um janet peterson says great works all three thank you for the enthusiasm and stories behind your inspirations you all make me want to go experiment well that's a good thing <laughs> uh and then Aaron says to everyone, are those seemingly woven fabric circles actually fabric or another material printed to resemble fabric? Um, or Aaron, were you talking about in- um, I, I was asking Marlene. Marlene, okay. There's like these little fabric like discs on the piece that's in the show that I was oh. wondering if that was like a camouflage illusion. It was an illusion that was um, actually um, from a fashion magazine, it was like an, a piece of a sweater that I put underneath it, but the colors cohered with the, um, the peonies in there. So uh, that's, yeah, so not fabric, but, um, you know, um, an image of an artifice. <laughs> um, I, I thought to question what I saw because of your process, or I was like, mm, I think that's a little sneaky camouflage happening. <laughs> But a good eye for the fabric um, yeah. texture. <laughs> uh, Steve Etlinger says, um, love the show, just wondering, Johnny, did you eventually find or sense a unifying theme? Um, I would say not really. I had a few different themes going on in the work. I kind of grouped the work um, loosely on themes. So there's like an abstraction wall. There's a wall that's um, kind of more figurative New York City walls. I kind of, um, once I picked everything, I kind of grouped them in ways that made sense to me. Um, so loose thematically, but uh, nothing that's like concrete. It wasn't, it wasn't a super structured curation. It was like, we, we did that once. We kind of grouped things in a kind of like perfect way, I guess. Um, but then as we hung the show, we kind of changed things in so many ways. So loosely themed, but not really, or stylistically themed, I guess. Uh, oh, and Johnny, this is a good question. Will you have a follow-up show with the non-selected works? <laughs> well, there's still like, uh, I don't know, 1300 of them. <laughs> so that that is a possibility. I mean, you know, when I was, when I was curating the show, it was, I mean, especially like the last 250 that I was cutting down to 80, I was like, oh, so I, I have a list of of works and artists who I am really into and uh, uh, but nothing, nothing concrete planned. I, I, I love I love so much of this work, so it would be hard to even do. I would have to do like four or five of them because there was that much good work. I can't I can't stress enough how much good work came in. So I'd have to do like four or five. So if you know of a giant space where I can put in, like do a huge show, please let me know. Uh, well, this might be a good time to mention your show coming up uh, at Established. Oh yeah. Uh, next week, we have a second small work show, a much, a much smaller small work show there. I think there's 11 artists right now who are in it. Um, and it's also going to be my birthday party. So everyone should come to the gallery next Friday um, from six to nine, that'll be super fun. And then to plug one more thing, I'm jumping off this Zoom talk and in two hours, I have another Zoom talk. We're doing an exhibition walkthrough uh, for established gallery for the work that's up right now, a uh, sculpturist named John Bungie. So if anyone wants to do another Zoom call in a couple hours, uh, you know, it's all, it's all on the established gallery website. Yeah, the rest stuff and jump back on <laughs> Zoom. Um, Johnny, maybe you want to put that in the chat just in case anybody wants to, you know, cut and paste 
the info for established on Friday, six to nine. Sure thing. Uh, and then I'll open the floor to questions for anybody that we've talked to this afternoon. Um, if you wanna just unmute and, and go ahead and ask your questions. Or um, we also welcome comments. Sometimes we just want to say how impressed we are with the work. That's welcome. Well, I would like to say that actually. I'd like to. Um, I, I have, you know, because I worked on the PowerPoint for this, I got a chance to really spend a lot of time with each of the images. And I'm just so impressed with the work. And it was really exciting to look at it you know over a, a longer period of time than just a few moments and um the three the three artists that spoke today it's so it means so much to me to hear your process and to hear what you're thinking about and how you got to where you did in the piece that you have in the show so i just really want to thank you all thank you uh, and I thank you it's been a pleasure to be able to talk about our work. And I just wanted to follow up what what Susan said that, um, you know, look at how rich each of these three artists um, have enriched us with just taking a little peek into their world. And imagine there's that same value in every single piece in this show. So um, thank you to everyone who is in the show. I think some other people in the show are here in our audience. So um, really such uh, so um, wonderful to hear what's behind the, the work. Thank if you. I can just piggyback off that as well. It was amazing hearing all three of you talk about your work. That was really interesting. It gave me a deeper understanding. But thank you to all of the artists who submitted, who were in the show it was it was such a wonderful experience so thank you all and thanks to everyone who came to this and thank you uh johnny and uh emily did an amazing job um curating the show so we're all really uh, appreciative and i feel like you should win some kind of olympic gold medal for that <laughs> installation i cannot even fathom how you even started <laughs> but it looked great thank you so much Well, if there are no other questions or comments, I want to point out our next show coming up in the gallery. It's Amanda Michelle Brown, Two Truths and a Lie. And it's starting, uh, opening on January 4th and going through February 5th, 2023. So, isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, Amanda, I see you're here. Uh, do you have your opening planned? Because I didn't have the date and time for the opening. Ooh, yeah, we do have an opening. Um, it should be the Saturday after we open. So that is going to be uh, the 7th. Um, we usually have them from uh, 4 to 6, but we'll solidify that more. 2023 seems so far away. So <laughs> we'll get there. So yeah, pencil that in on your calendar, Saturday the 7th from four to six for the opening for Amanda Michelle's amazing show. I can't wait to see. <laughs> um, and I'm just gonna check the messages, make sure there wasn't another question for anyone. And, uh, and I think it's mainly thank you. So I'm just going to say one more thank you to everybody here. Everybody who came, thank you for coming. Everybody who spoke, thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.